Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. This is Jesus or Muhammad, and we got a special edition for you. Yes, once again, Mubasha, that means in the flesh. Here we are. If you're ready, if you're not, Brother David Wood, we're always glad to have him in the studio. David, thanks for being here. And uh, amen, amen. And then Brother Walid Shabbat. We're really honored to have Brother Walid here. Brother Walid, thanks so much for coming on two nights in a row. You bet. Thank you for having me. Putting up with me as a host. You're a great host. <laughs> God bless you, brother. <laughs> you know, we've got an exciting program. You know, last night we were talking about Brother Walid's book, God's War on Terror, Islam, Prophecy, and the Bible. Now, uh, we're going to talk some more about that tonight. Uh, Brother Shubat's uh, website, Brother Walid's website, is going to be on our screen a little bit, www.shoebat.com. There it is. And uh, Brother Walid has this book that's basically putting forth the uh, assertion that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Islam, the religion of Islam, is the system, the Antichrist system spoken of in the Bible, and that the Antichrist individual in the last days, he will be a Muslim. That's correct. And, uh, and also that in Islamic end times theology, that's when we say the word eschatology, that means the theology of the end times. In Islamic end times theology, eschatology, we see a, a answer or a fit to what is being described in the Bible as the Satanic Antichrist movement. Is that correct? That's correct. Well, we've got a lot to talk about tonight, and I want <laughs> Brother Walid to uh, share uh, some more in depth. This book is over 500 pages, and he's going to be talking a lot tonight about the Bible in particular, the oh, prophecies. Yeah. Putting the puzzle together uh -huh. and you know, putting the whole concepts together. There is a lot there, and uh, before he gets in depth, now I want to remind you this is a live talk show, and after our first break in about 20 minutes or so, we're going to open the lines, 248-416-1300. You have a chance to ask Brother Walid a question or give a comment, uh, but before he goes more in depth, I want him to just give a, a brief outline to our viewers of, of what essentially, just essentially, we don't want to go into too much detail, what essentially does the Christian in times teaching say will happen? And what essentially does the general, uh, you know, a general outline yeah. of what Muslim in times teaching uh, says? Yes. Uh, you know, the, the story of the Bible is a story of man's redemption. Yeah. It's also the story of the confrontation between God and the evil one, which is Lucifer in this case. Right. Islamic concept of Lucifer or a shaitan is quite different from the concept of uh, the biblical Lucifer. There's mm -hmm. a lot in the uh, Bible that talks about uh, Lucifer or shaitan mm -hmm. uh, in which the Quran really lacks. Mm -hmm. When the Quran talks about the shaitan, it gives him uh, very, uh, very minimalist kind of views in which uh, shaitan basically did not know or the demons did not know that Solomon's stick staff was rotting when he died. Mm -hmm. It took them two years and so on and so forth. So it's the confrontation. And the yeah. end in the Bible yeah. is the confrontation is between Jesus and the son of Lucifer, mm. the son of perdition, who will be the Antichrist. Islamic uh, Antichrist basically is a, a different concept. He comes from a different area than uh, where the Antichrist comes from, from the Bible. Uh, the messianic view of Islam versus the messianic view of the Bible and the confrontation in the end. The Islamic view is the coming of the Mahdi, of course. Islamic Mahdism is part and parcel of the Islamic religion. Both Sunni and Shia talk about the Mahdi. <coughs> if you look at the Mahdi in Islam, uh, he brings seven years of peace after tremendous chaos on the earth. So uh, from the biblical concept, this Mahdi is mentioned really in the Bible. He brings seven years of peace in the book of Daniel. He, you know, he, in fact, he makes a covenant of seven years between Israel and the surrounding Muslim nations in which the treaty is broken in the middle. And after that, the confrontation begins between Islam and, and in this case, the Judeo-Christian world, in which mm. the uh, victory will be for Christ in the end. Christ will defeat the Mahdi. Mm. So this whole Islamic eschatological concept is switching everything upside down, making the biblical Christ, in a way, how he is described, to be the Antichrist, because they say the Antichrist of Islam comes out of Jerusalem, leading the Jews and the Christians. From a biblical concept, 
that's definitely our Messiah. So uh, the whole crux of the book is really going in depth into the Islamic eschatological mindset, saying this is what Muslims claim, this is what the Bible states. In fact, it's not only I'm making the claim, the assertion that Islam is the system of the Antichrist. You look at some of the greatest biblical scholars in the world. Right. John Wesley, he also supports the idea of Islam <coughs> of being the Antichrist. And this is, by the way, in Walid's book. Yeah, yes, Hilar Belak, Gregory Palamas, Huzaya Lich, Cyril of Jerusalem, Sophronius. Muslims should know about Sophronius. That's when Umar ibn al-Khattab conquered Jerusalem, and Sophronius said, here comes the advancy of the Antichrist. Sophronius described how Islam ravished the, the, the area, how they burned the, the lands, and all the claims that Muslims were so nice to Jerusalem. It's yeah. really fallacious. It's not yeah. true. Good. Sophronius' yeah. account gives us the account from that history of what mm. happened. Mm. And Sophronius talked about how that's the Antichrist. Mm. You have John of Damascus, who lived at the advancy of Islam. He was a Syrian uh, scholar, Christian scholar, and he talked about also uh, Islam being the Antichrist. You have Jonathan Edwards. You have uh, Sir Robert Anderson, who mm. wrote a phenomenal book talk, talk, uh, titled <coughs> The Coming Prince. In The Coming Prince, he talks about how the 70 weeks of Daniel, how Christ, the dating of Christ, how Christ came to the exact date in his ministry when he was crucified. Yeah. You know, in Daniel and, 9, right? Yes, these kind of things don't exist in the Quran. It's amazing if Muslims would sit with us for one hour to discuss Daniel 9 and how God in the Bible prophesied the exact date and Christ is crucified. Amazing. His ministry, it's absolutely amazing. I've never seen things like that. They'll never take the time to sit with us, though. That's the problem. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I'm sorry. Though. Yeah. So in a nutshell, you know, it compares the different views of Islam and the biblical view. And it shows how Lucifer took biblical concept and switched everything around in reverse, in which... Uh, the victory, of course, is to Islam. Uh, if the victory is to Islam, Muslims need to ask themselves the question. Uh, they haven't won any war against Israel lately. Yeah. They've lost in uh, 1948. They lost in 67. They lost in 73. Was Allah not on their side? What's going on? Uh, they were never able to basically take over all Christendom. Mm. Muhammad says first Constantinople, then Rome. Well, Rome is not Islamic. Well, you might think not yet, but it is not. So... You're trying to fulfill your prophecies, especially the end of times, you know, the end, uh, the Islamic Muhammad, the prophet of Islam said that the day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel and Jerusalem yeah. and the surrounding mm. nations. Mm. So they want another Holocaust, like a Hitler <coughs> kind of Holocaust mm. that is not, they're not going to succeed because Christ will come down and defend in this case, uh, the Jerusalem and the Christian world. In fact, he comes in Isaiah 19 to yeah. defend the Egyptian Copts. Yeah. This is a good message to our Coptic brethren. Right. You know, don't worry, Christ is coming. Amen. It says that they will ask for a <coughs> savior yeah. and God will send them a mighty one. Hallelujah. Well, the mighty one is the Messiah. Hallelujah. So he will come to defend the Coptic Christians in Egypt. Yes. And the suffering Christians everywhere. Yes. So, uh, praise God. Well, okay, now before we go to the callers, because we've already got callers, uh, I got a question for you, Brother yes. Wally. I'm not going to let you go without this one because as you realize, uh, the church uh, in the world, whatever it is now, two and a half billion or something, still Muslims, by the way, the largest religion in the world is Christianity, not Islam, just to remind you. Uh, anyways, we have all sorts of groups. We've got Catholicism, we've got yeah. uh, Protestants, we've got, you know, we've got the Orthodox. And then within the Protestant church, we have all of these different views, you know, and, and Muslims try to present themselves as a monolith, but of course, as you know, Muslims have all kind of different views too. Oh, yes. But concerning end times, there is a lot of different views. Yes. Now, without confusing Muslims or Christians, I just want to ask you, what about, what do you say, <clears throat> I mean, of course you disagree with these people, but these folks who uh, are tend to a more covenantal view, for people who know what we're talking about, otherwise I won't des describe it, uh, essentially say, well, now, all of this prophecy in the Old Testament somehow has already been fulfilled, or it's simply allegorical, all of it spiritual. It has nothing to do with, with the modern-day state of Israel or the Jews or anything like that. What, what's your message? Because this is a large group of people that yes, claim to be Christians. It's very important for you to speak to that. I know. 
And there are many object about Israel being mentioned in the Bible. However, we do believe that Israel will be redeemed in yes. the end, and they will believe in Christ. And this is on its way when Christ comes. So we have yeah. to wait. We <coughs> sometimes judge what's going on in Israel politically of what the current politics is. Right. Not to enter into current politics blaming Israel for this or blaming the Palestinians for that. Sure. That's not the topic of the subject tonight. Right. But Israel coming back to the land yeah. is part of the biblical prophetic subject. Mm. You, there is a verse in Amos chapter 9, verse 15. Mm-hmm. I've been challenging anyone in the world to respond to that question so far. No one has came with the answer. It says in Amos chapter 9, verse 15, And I, God in this case, will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled out of that land. Okay, mm-hmm. God's going to plant the Jewish people back in the land the Bible calls Israel. All right, whether you like it or you don't like it, the Jews are back in the state of Israel. Now, if we say this is a historic verse, if you want to look at the Amal, everything in the Bible is already fulfilled. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> how is it that God says, I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled out of that land? It's impossible to pluck them out of the land. Mm-hmm. Where they were pulled out of the land in the Roman diaspora. They were pulled out of the land in the Babylonian diaspora. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is talking about a time it's impossible to pull, to pull the Jews out of the land. Yeah. We tried in 48, we lost. 67, we lost. 73, we lost. You know, and there's another attempt in the end in which the Islamic Confederacy will come and they will also lose in the end. So, if this is historic, then the Bible is lying. Mm. Mm. They were pulled out of the land. Yeah. Either the Bible is inaccurate if those yeah. people call themselves Christian. Right. Either the Bible is inaccurate, yeah. or it's talking about the future that we live in. Right. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, thus says the Lord, the day is coming that no longer will the children of Israel say that God who's brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Mm. So, mm. in other words, the story of the Exodus yeah. from Egypt to Israel, forget about that. Right. And it continues in the verse, it says, but the Lord lives who brought the forth the children of Israel out of the land of the north, mm-hmm. Russia, yeah. and out of all the lands, plural, where he has driven them. This is not a single country, not <coughs> Egypt. It's right. out of all the lands, all sure. the countries where they have been driven. Right. When was that fulfilled mm. if this is a historic piece of you know, information? Sure. Sure. It's impossible. Right. You know, they've only been uh, re, you know, sent back to the land or went back to the land, traveled from 1948 after the Holocaust. In fact, the Holocaust itself yeah. is described. The Holocaust of both Christians and Jews. Mm. The Holocaust on the persecution of the church and yeah. the persecution of the Jewish people right. is pretty well documented in the Bible. Mm. In Ezekiel, the Valley of the Dry Bones, even the birth of Israel, described in the Bible that will happen in one day. Yeah. May 14th, 1948, in one day, God will create that state. Yeah. Now, whether we politically agree with that state, don't agree with that state, I think we have to... Wait on God. God will redeem all of us. Yeah. If Muslims believe Jesus is coming back, right, and we Christians believe Jesus is coming back, <laughs> yes. and he's going to fix all the problems, yes. don't you think that in the end, Jew and Arab will be shaking hands? They will be peace at last. Yeah. Well, we certainly pray so, and we believe so through the cross of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He's torn down the middle wall of separation That's between good. us. Hallelujah. Well, I think we already have callers, and I want to get to those callers. Brother David, any, any comments? Uh, anything? Okay. Brother, we're going to hear more from Brother David in tonight's second show, talking about the spread of Islam and the myth of uh, Islam's uh, gifted uh, or, or superiority uh, with, with the Lord because of uh, their quick spread and rapid spread. We're going to be exposing the myths of uh, that apologetic talking about what actually happened, and I'm glad you brought that up with, who's it, Sophonius? Sophonius. Sophonius. Sophonius in Jerusalem. You know, Muslims always say, oh, they just walked in, and the people accepted them, and everywhere. The Omar covenant was a peaceful covenant, and they gave covenant to the Christians of peace and all of this. Oh, yeah. Yes, I don't know if you guys know, but Islam spread from Mecca 
all the way to Spain in the west, and yeah. all the way to India in the east. Not peacefully. one person was killed. Peacefully. It was, all, it was all defense. Every step oh. of the way, it was oh. all oh. defense. It was all defense. Are you saying Tariq bin Ziyad did not attack Spain? It was all defensive war? It was all defensive. Was defensive. When he said, <laughs> Al-Bahru wara'akum wal adu iza'akum. You know, the sea is behind you and the enemy is ahead of you. He burned the ships so the Muslims could fight till, till death because be either you drown or you die till death. Defense. Defensive warfare. Come on, Walid. Are you an Islamophobe? What's <laughs> yeah. wrong with you? All right. Well, I'm a proud Islamophobe. Hallelujah. Actually, I'm not an Islamophobe. You know, they say that. Uh, you do, do we look scared? <laughs> Ooh, we don't do know. we look scared uh, at all? Uh, but uh, well, what would be the correct uh, scientific term, you know, for, for an Islam skeptic? I don't know what. Uh, I don't know. Anyways, Muslims can tell us. They'll just tell us we hate Muslims, but we don't. We love you, and that's why we're doing this we're show. We're doubting Thomas's? Well, doubting, <laughs> doubting Muhammad. Doubting Muhammad, yeah. R that's, Robert, uh, Robert, Robert Spencer coined a term for uh, all, every time, uh, Care keeps calling everyone Islamophobes. Uh, he said, I think they've got Islamophobophobia. Islamophobophobia. Yes, Islamophobia. They're, they're that's, that's, horribly afraid of Islamophobes. And, and let me just make one more comment, because I know that we've touched on an idol, and so we've got to touch on it one more time. Uh, this idea of Muhammad. Uh, talking about Muhammad in Islam being worshipped. Now, yes, we understand that, that Orthodox Islam says you worship Allah alone and not Muhammad. But once again, as we said before, not only uh, do we see hordes of Muslims uh, wanting to emulate this man, elevating him above all other prophets. Uh, there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, not Jesus or Adam or anyone else. And, and we talked about that. And then we said Muhammad itself uh, means praised one, and uh, it's interesting, you know, praised one. When you put the mu in front of the word, it kind of makes it a noun. It makes, and, and, but Allah, one of his 99 names is Al-Hamid, which is, uh, would be the one who is praised, or the one who is praiseworthy, I think. Uh, but it's interesting, if Al-Hamid is one of the 99 names of Allah, the, that, that same root, ha mim de hamid, is the same word you say, alhamdulillah, you praise Allah, but yet Muhammad, he is the one praised. who is to be praised. To me, that sounds like Muhammad and Allah are pretty much one. Yes. And now they wouldn't admit that, but it sounds awful fishy. And that, that guy who called yeah. him last night and talked about Muhammad and Allah. That's in the mosque. Yes. Even in uh, Hagia Sophia, yes. you find a big, big way up high, Allah on one big circle plaque, and write it, Muhammad. Yes. Allah, Muhammad. Allah, Muhammad. Which one is greater? That's a question for our Muslim Yeah, Muslims, call. I think, need to stop claiming yeah. and start looking at the actual mm -hmm. things that they believe. Right. In other words, the Bible says, you know, man could be worshipping money. Yeah. If you love money, whatever you adore the most, is what you worship. Right. The so it, it is not the claim, it is the fact. Right. We've got to look at the fact of what to do. Absolutely. When they bow down to uh, uh, the black stone, that's a fact. <coughs> they do this. They look towards the black stone. Though they claim they don't worship this as a deity, right. but the act itself is an act that is, should be only done to a deity. Right. You cannot w bow down towards a black stone, especially. Right. That the, you know, it's something that the pagans adored. Yeah. And Ibrahim had no contact with it whatsoever. Right. All these claims that Ibrahim used to caress it and kiss it and all these things. And Ismail built the Kaaba. Uh, see, this is, this, is, this is a big question I ask my Muslim friends. I always say, okay, you claim these things yeah. about the Kaaba. You claim <coughs> about Ibrahim building the Kaaba. You make yeah. all these claims. If the world truly takes you seriously, yeah. how come we don't have something called the Quranic Archaeological Review. Yeah, right. We have today the <laughs> Biblical Archaeological Review, yeah. in which archaeologists debate back and forth about the Shroud of Turin, mm -hmm. about uh, the findings they find in Jerusalem. Bible. Somebody made up something, a, a fake artifact. They're yeah. always debating over these yeah. issues. And they go to the Bible to find the cities mentioned in the Bible. Right. Where is any serious archaeologist going to find the place where Ad and Thamud used to live? Wow, here we find... <laughs> A parchment or a piece of rock written, here lives Ad and Thamud, you yeah, know, or something yeah, like that. Yeah. You don't find Quranic archaeological review. They need to ask yeah. themselves that question, why? Yeah. The Mormons don't have Mormon archaeology, the Book of Mormon archaeological review. It doesn't they exist. They closed the department after they couldn't find In it. In other words, <laughs> if historians and archaeologists 
None of them take seriously the Quran. Yeah. Doesn't that give them a message? Yeah. Yeah. If they took it seriously, there'll be some sort of examination. It's a good point. It's a good point. Well, that's once again, you know, uh, Ravi Zacharias quoted somebody. I don't think it was his original, but he said, you know, the, the Bible is like an anvil that has worn out many hammers. I really like that. I was one of those hammers. Yeah. Well, there you go. You yeah. So he got worn down. <laughs> Praise God for that because now he's a brother in Christ. You see, the problem is that when I read the Bible, yeah. I found us as Muslims, yeah. when I was Muslim, in yeah. it. Yeah. I'll give you just one simple example. Yeah, go ahead. In the Psalms, yeah. I urge every Muslim to read the Psalms. Yeah. Uh, Zabur uh, as the yes, idea. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, the Psalms, in Psalm chapter 80, verse... Uh, uh, the whole thing, if I look at verse 6, you have made us a strife to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. This is talking about Israel, the Jewish people. They are hated by their neighbors. Well, mm -hmm. of course, Syria hates them, Lebanon hates them. Yeah. All the countries surrounding them hate them. Yeah. And in verse 14, the plight of the Jewish people in the end, they say, return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. God to return, to come back. Well, who came there the first time? It was Christ. Yeah. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand had planted. And then he talks about verse 15 uh, in Psalm 81, verse 15. Psalm 81, verse 15 is interesting. It says, the haters <coughs> of the Lord would pretend submission to him. Mm. The ones who hate God yeah. think in their mind that they submit to God. That's mm -hmm. amazing. I read that. Mm -hmm. I was, I said, wait a minute. Yeah. God talks about the ones who hate him. Yeah. He says, the ones who hate me think in their mind that they submit to me, that mm. they worship me. Mm. Islam means what? Submission to God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then it goes, it's quite amazing. <coughs> in chapter 82, verse eight, it says, arise, O God, judge the earth. For you shall inherit all nations. Well, who inherits all nations? Mm. Christ. Christ Jesus. He man. will inherit all nations and establish his kingdom. God will arise, mm. come down to earth. Hallelujah. That's Christ. And look what he says. This is when he will come. It says in verse 2, For behold, your enemies make a tumult. God's enemies. Psalm they make 83. a plan. They have a plan. And those who hate you, have lifted up their head in pride. These people are pride-filled. They laugh all the time. Their pride and they hate God have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel and consulted together against your sheltered ones. Verse 4, <coughs> they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a people. Let us destroy these people altogether. Yeah. Let's destroy them. In fact, if you're in doubt what it's talking about, look at the verse that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. Mm. Israel will be wiped off the face of the map. Now, That's exactly what we've seen in the Arab-Israeli wars, exactly what we've seen the Muslims talking about now. It names the nations, which ones they are. The Hajarites, Jibal, Ammon, that's Jordan, Tyre, that's Lebanon, Assyria, Syria, Iraq, not mm. Assyrian Christians. Right. People get confused. Right, right, right. No. <laughs> uh, Syria, Iraq, you know, yeah. Turkey, join with them in a coalition. Yeah. And look what, what, what God says. God says in verse 16, Fill their faces with shame, they will lose the war. That they, the Muslims, may seek your name, O Lord. Mm. In other words, God will make them lose the war mm. so they can recognize his true name. Mm. It's not Allah, it is <coughs> Yahweh. It is not Muhammad, it is Jesus. And that's the whole concept of why the Muslim world always loses the battle. Mm. Mm. Well, Brother Walid, one more thing before we go to the callers. Now, these things were, um, were recited, uh, according to our understanding, about a thousand years before Jesus. That's correct. So now, would you say that David is speaking about actual events and situations during his time, which foreshadowed the end times no. as well? No, because even though they had problems with the uh, Edom, they had problems with yeah. some of these nations. Yeah, what it says here, they have taken crafty counsel and consulted together against your sheltered one. Mm -hmm. They form a confederacy <coughs> against you. Yeah. These nations will come as a confederacy together. Right. This never happened before in the past. 
David did not understand what he was even writing, you know. Mm. Yet he says, they come as a, all of the enemies we've ever had in the past, they will come one day all together in a confederacy against Israel. <coughs> exactly. So this is like, sort of like the Messianic Psalms in a sense. Absolutely. Yeah. In which Christ will come and he will redeem Israel. Israel will not be, as you know today, Israel. It will be redeemed Israel. There'll be no more problems between Arab and Jew. There'll be nothing but peace. He will be the one who brings the true peace, not the Mahdi. The one the Mahdi claims to bring seven years of peace is a lie in accordance to the Bible. That's the Antichrist. And once again, uh, we find that here is prophecy in the Bible speaking about real end time events. Where is something comparable in the Quran? There isn't. There's nothing. <laughs> This is their best and only. Yeah. And, and it was what, like uh, six years before it took place? Well, the they, 50, do have, you know, they do have prophecies about Alexander the Great, but if you look at it, <coughs> it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Well, uh, Alexander the Great was before. Yes. So what kind of prophecy? Anyways. We the Alexander is coming back, basically. Oh, oh, I don't know okay. what they're talking du about. Dual al Qarnain. Dual yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Interesting. Well, maybe some Muslims will call and... And uh, give us some good argument. We, we're hungry. We'd like some good arguments from Muslims uh, to say, yes, you're right. Islam is Antichrist. Or no, Islam and Christianity are just so friendly. And uh, what Brother Walid is saying is completely incorrect. And here's my reasons why. We'd like to hear that. Muslims, Christians, whoever you are, give us a call. 248-416-1300. And before I go to the calls, the last thing, I'm a preacher, I'm sorry. The last thing that I want to do is just to remind you, we are still technically uh, in a fundraiser. And here at ABN, we do need your prayers. We need your support. And uh, what an honor to have Brother Walid on the program. What a great opportunity for you as our viewers. And we pray that you would prayerfully consider giving, even as the Lord has blessed you, to our uh, station so that we can continue to produce quality broadcasts like this. Thank you so much, dear viewers. And now let's go straight to our callers. I'd like to welcome the first caller tonight. Welcome, you're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello, you're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello, Pastor Joe. How are you doing, Brother Walid, Brother David? Doing good. Um, good. God bless you. I would just like to I'd just like to start off and let you guys know that this is an amazing job. What ABN is doing currently in the past couple weeks is an amazing job. Praise God. I really I could really tell there's a huge difference with the dec like the interior studio decorations, the different camera angles and just it's it's really an amazing amazing feat. Um yeah. and also the the being of uh, Brother Walid here is a great blessing to all of us because yes. I learned so many new things for, with it, with these shows. It's it's really opening your eyes to see new thoughts and new ideas. Yes. Um. So my question for uh, Brother Walid. Yes. Um. He I believe you stated something that you said the Antichrist is going to appear as a Muslim. Yes. Okay, so if they're supposed to, if the if the Antichrist is supposed to convince people to go to his side, to act as if he is the real Christ, how will he convince other religions of non-Islamic and non-Christian? First of all, like, what you need to understand, Buddhism. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, he's going to answer that question, and then you'll get a chance to add on. Yeah. Most people who read the Bible, they say, well, Antichrist, he's somebody who claims to be Jesus. False. That's not true. That's not what the biblical concept of Antichrist. First of all, he is anti-Christ. He is against Christ. He will not come say, I died on the cross, but in reality, he's a fake Jesus. No, no, no. He will deny the cross. He's not going to come to say, my father sent me. No, no, no. He denies the father. He is anti-Christ. What better this fits than a Muslim Mahdi? Because Islam, supposedly, when the Mahdi comes, he will correct the Jews and the Christians to tell them that Jesus was never crucified. He will come to deny the Trinity. He will come to do all these things. So if he comes to do all these things, he is anti-Christ. He is against the concept of who Christ is. Just when I was reading in Psalm uh, chapter 80, 81, and 80, 82, and 83, uh, that they may let them, let them seek your name, O Lord. In, in other words, the enemy that comes against Israel in the ends of days, that's the army of the Antichrist. God says he will make them lose so they can recognize God's name. People think about, you know, 
How do they recognize God's name? In verse 16, Psalm 83, verse 16, one of the most amazing verses in the Bible. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Okay, whose name alone. Now what's the name? You think, okay, maybe they will recognize Jesus. That's not only it. A name in the Bible is very important to understand how we understand name. Uh, his name shall be called Emmanuel, which yes. means God with us. Yes. That's our creed. I think I mentioned that yesterday. Yes. That they finally recognize <laughs> the true creed of who God is. That God is the Emmanuel. That God is with us. Yes. Not like Islam, God is up there. No, God will be down here with us, amongst us, dwelling with us. This is why God wanted to build a temple. This is why God said His Spirit, His Holy Spirit will dwell in the temple before Christ came. And this is the whole concept of the temple in Jerusalem. And the whole Jewish faith is regarding God being present with us. So Muslims reject this concept. Their concept is absolutely the opposite. So Antichrist <coughs> rejects these concepts. He comes to deny everything that Christ stands for. Who will he claim to be, the, this Muslim Antichrist? Who will he claim to be when he comes? He will claim to be the, the peacemaker. He will claim to be the one to establish peace in the world. He will claim to be a Messiah. The Mahdi. He, the Mahdi. You know, you don't have to call him Jesus. See, this is a whole confusion. People think he's going to call himself Jesus. My name is Jesus. No. Yeah, yeah. He's going to call himself a different name. Okay. But he's going to come, in essence, representing as a representation as a messiah he's going to claim messianic okay. claims yeah but he's not going to say i am the messiah okay so that's why the muslims are confused you know yeah. they think that when jesus comes they're going to say i am you know when the antichrist comes they're going to say i am jesus no it's not yeah. true okay all right brother go ahead if you have some more questions i thought that's because because i was taught differently actually i was okay. taught that he was supposed to come and try to convince us that he was the real christ Okay, let, let, me, let me bring up a verse. Maybe you're thinking of this, and Brother Walid could speak to it. What about uh, 2 Thessalonians, yes. Brother Walid? Chapter 2, it talks about uh, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, talking about uh, the Thessalonians thought perhaps the day of the Lord was upon them or had already come. And uh, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, says in verse 3, 2 Thessalonians 2, Let no one deceive you by any means. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, that's the Antichrist, right? That's correct. Okay, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now, to our caller, is this kind of what you're referring to? Yes, yeah. Okay, yes. so what does that mean? I mean, is he going well, to call remember, himself God? Or? Remember, Muhammad claiming these claims, yes. Muhammad making his names for himself. The praised one. You know, he doesn't say, I am God. Yeah. He's claiming to be God by the essence of what he claims. Gotcha. The Bible says he claims to be God. You see, there is a, a catch-22 here. Yeah. If you look at Daniel 2, I think we'll get a much better <laughs> picture okay. of what is intended from Second Thessalonians chapter 2. All right. In Daniel 2, mm -hmm. Sorry, let's go there. Daniel chapter, sorry, Daniel chapter 11. Daniel okay. chapter 11. Okay. My apologies. In Daniel chapter 11, it says in verse 37, regarding the Antichrist, He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. Oh, wow, maybe he claims to be God himself. Okay, mm. in essence, yes. But look what else it says. But in their place, these gods of his fathers, he shall honor a God of war, a God mm, of fortresses. Mm, mm. Well, he does worship a God. Yeah. In the same essence, he claims to be God. Yeah. See, there's a catch-22. Muhammad. Muhammad claims he's not God, but he does claim he is God. Yeah. That's what yeah. the, the whole thing. Yeah. And Muhammad says, the Mahdi <laughs> yeah. is of my essence. Mm. The Mahdi will have my spirit in him. <laughs> in other words, Muhammad and the Mahdi, from the Islamic concept, is the same person. And that's the no. same spirit that caused him to fall and rise that's, and have epileptic right. seizures. That's right. And, yeah. and if we continue, and a God which his fathers did not know. So the Antichrist does worship a God. Mm. He's not even atheist as some claim. Mm. You know, So he does worship a God, and in the same time, he does claim and give aspects to himself as his actions. Yeah. He's claiming to be God. He sits as a, in the temple of God as he is God. Very interesting. 
Uh, the, in fact, Islam does believe that the Mahdi will rule from the Temple Mount. And he will sit on the Temple Mount. Well. It's part of the Islamic concept. This is why many Americans ask the question, Western <coughs> Christians, they say, well, how are the Muslims going to allow the Jews to build the Temple? Very simple. Yeah. Because the Mahdi in Islam will make a covenant with one of the children of Aaron. In other words, an Israelite. Mm. You see, mm. he'll make a covenant with one of the children of <coughs> Aaron. And he will go to the Temple Mount. And he will rule from the Temple Mount. And he will allow the Jews to build what they call Masjid Sulaiman. Yeah. The okay. Solomonic Temple. There okay. it goes. And then look what it says. Look at it. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god. He will mm. declare war against the strongest, mightiest nation in the world. That will be the U.S. in this case. With a foreign god. Mm. In the name of a foreign god. You see, he does worship a god. Yeah. So if you look at the whole context of the <laughs> Bible, the Antichrist will claim to be God, will also worship a God at the same time. This is like Muhammad and Allah, once again, well, what we've been talking about. You know, it's like looking at the verses in the Bible, okay? Yeah. When the Muslims argue, they say, Jesus never claimed to be God. Yeah. Say, okay, well, prove it. Yeah. Well, there he is worshiping God. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Uh, Jesus never claimed, you know, because Jesus was the son of God. He was yeah. God incarnate. Yeah. He was also a prophet. He was yeah. also a rabbi. He yeah. was also a high priest. He was right. also, he had to fulfill all these things. Sure. The same essence, the Antichrist does the same thing. Oh. He wants to mimic Jesus. So he wants to basically fulfill many concepts. Counterfeit. Counterfeit. Exactly. Amazing. Excellent. Okay, brother, do you have anything else you want to ask Brother Walid before we move on? Yeah, just the last thing. Uh, where can I find your book, Brother Walid? It's very simple. It's cheaper for you to buy it from Amazon. But it would delight me if you buy it from my website. It's more expensive than my website, so <laughs> it depends. It's up to you. Amazon.com has it, and also my website is shubat.com, as you spell the word shoe, S-H-O-E, and bat, B-A-T, S-H-O-E, B-A-T, dot com. Okay. And also you can call a telephone number if you want a telephone number, 720-720-935-1000. Twenty-six, seven, twenty, nine, thirty-five, twenty-eight, twenty-six. That will be faster, but again, that will be the full price. Okay, thank you very much. You're God welcome. God bless you all and the whole crew of ABN. God bless you, brother. Fundraiser. Thanks so much for your encouraging words and your questions. The Lord bless you and keep you. All right, why don't we take just a short break, and I will be right back to take uh, many more of your phone calls. Hear your views on uh, this excellent teaching by our dear brother Walid Shubat. We'll be right back after this break. Praise the Lord. Here we are again with Jesus or Muhammad Special Edition with Brother David Wood and Brother Walid Shabbat talking about his book, God's War on Terror, talking about the end times, the end times in Islam 
and in Christianity, it seems that in the end times, uh, these two very different views have an intersection. They collide. They collide. That's right. And where they collide is uh, Yom al or the last That's day, right. right? That's right. They collide in which the Muslims think that their eschatological things are being fulfilled. Yeah. And, of course, they don't understand. They have been set up by the devil yeah. till the last second. Yeah. In other words, they will come and converge on Israel. Yeah. But in the last second, yeah. Christ will come down on the Mount of Olives, mm. and all the saints will be with him. Mm. And the battle will commence in Jerusalem, mm. and all the Islamic hordes will be destroyed. Mm. In fact, just in Daniel 11, if you yeah. Could, yeah. in Daniel 11, if you continue, look what it says. It says, it says, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. The mm. Antichrist occupies Egypt. Mm. The Egyptians will follow him in submission. Verse 43, he shall have power over the treasures and gold of silver, <coughs> And over the precious things of Egypt, also the Libyans and the Ethiopians, in this case not Ethiopia, modern Ethiopia, yeah. it's the Sudan and Somalia, shall follow at his heels. Mm. And other translations, it says, will follow him in submission. Mm. You know, mm. Islam means submission. They will join him. Yeah. They will be forced to join him. Yeah. And he will take over Egypt because of the Qanat al Suez. Mm. Qanat al Suez is an important, you know. In Suez fact, Canal. that's yeah. right. In fact, even even the Bible predicts about the destruction of the the the, the Aswan Dam. Huh. Egypt will be destroyed from the Aswan Dam yeah. all the way to the borders of Ethiopia and Sudan. Mm. Mm. Egypt is about will, will be destroyed when the Messiah comes yeah. to fight against uh, this uh, Antichrist who will Amazing. rule also Egypt. Amazing, Amazing, troubling. Uh, but praise the Lord, we do believe that. Uh, well, by the way, that's a question real quick. I, just, I don't want to uh, confuse people too much, but uh, what about Christians who are fearful from what you're saying, that they're believing what you say, and they're like, Why should they be fearful? Well, I mean, you know, if they're going to have to go through this time of, of the, the Muslim Antichrist, and, and it seems to be there's going to be a lot of saints that are going to lose their life. Lose their heads. Lose their heads. Yes. And so they're fearful now if they believe what you say, which probably a lot of them do, uh, what, what's the answer? How, how do you encourage them? Well, uh, Christ took upon himself a cross. And, you know, if we are Christian, we are to be Christ-like. Yeah. If Christ took a cross, yeah. we also are going to take a cross. Right. So we are going to suffer. There is nothing you can do about it. But the difference <coughs> is that in, 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 in Christianity, we suffer with joy yeah. because we know what the outcome is. So we can't live life thinking that there's not going to be suffering. Right. You see? Right. In other words, Jesus himself said, <coughs> if you attempt to lose your life, you will save it. Yeah. If you attempt to save your life, you will lose it. Yeah. Brother Joseph, what you're doing in front of this camera right here, yeah. you're attempting to lose your life. <laughs> and you're saving it. Praise God. So this is the problem I tell my Arab friends who yeah. are out there listening to us yeah. and who are afraid to come out of the closet. Yeah. You say, well, a good speak point. out. Why are you not speaking out? Well, yeah. I have family in yeah. Egypt. I have family here. I have sure. family there. Sure. But that's not what Christ wants. That's he wants right. us to come out. Hallelujah. I am still living. So why are you so worried? Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, excellent. We've got more callers. Why don't we take the next one right now? Welcome. You're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Yes, uh, wonderful, wonderful show. God bless you guys. And you. Uh, this question is for Brother Walid. Uh, I, I watch, I've seen your sermons on the Internet many a times. Very, very beautiful. Um, my question is, what relations do we, uh, do we have with regarding to end times prophecy and also with worshiping on Sunday versus the Sabbath? Is that the sign of the Satan or not? Or where, where are we at with this? Uh, do you want the first part of your question? Because the second part of your question doesn't really touch on the subject. I always get these callers <coughs> who want to change the subject. Okay. Is it Sabbath or is it Sunday? Okay. You know, I don't want to get into that. If Brother Joseph likes to get into that, that's okay. fine. But uh, the first part of your question, what was it? The first part of my question is, if, uh, you know, I'm all right there with you as far as the end times, as far as, you know, the, the Muslim end time prophecies being how <laughs> it's so related to Christianity, but there is the Antichrist. I really want to know if, if worshiping on Sunday, really, that's my main question to you. I mean, I'm, I'm with you the whole way, but my only struggle is, is Sunday the Sabbath or is Saturday the Sabbath? And if worshiping on Sunday, are we worshiping Satan or, or we're not? Why? Well, the disciples oh, met on the first day of the week. 
So it is not a problem. Jesus resurrected on that first day. That shouldn't be a problem either. Jesus is our resurrection. So since he is our resurrection, the resurrection, and he was resurrected on Sunday, that's why we worship on Sunday. As a matter, you know, what we need to do is basically focus on dedicating a Sabbath to the Lord, one day to the Lord. Now we can talk about Saturday and Sunday and get deviated over here and divide the church over this issue. So much Christ wants us to unite. This is a time of unity and not a type of div- uh, a time for division uh, over the issue of the Sabbath. Or you know, uh, in fact, the New Testament talks about you know don't be heed about diet diets and all these things and uh, new moons and you know Sabbath. sa- Sabbaths and yeah. all of these things. Let's not focus in these things. So, in accordance to Scripture, don't focus on this this kind of thing. Just focus on one thing. When you meet Christ in the end, Christ, if he asks you, why should you enter into my kingdom? Would you say because you were baptized by dunking versus sprinkling? Because the pastor used a wooden pulpit versus a fiberglass pulpit. Or because, you know, you didn't eat pork. Or because, or what did you do about him? When I meet Christ in the end, I would say, it's what I did about you. Amen. That's why I should enter into your kingdom. Amen. What are you doing about the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Okay, thank you, Brother Walid. Any other questions, dear caller? Yeah, you know, that, that's wonderful, and amen, and, and God bless. Absolutely. I'm not about to get into dividing us. We definitely need to be united. Yeah, be but, careful. Uh, People I drive you into all kinds of pre-trib, most post-trib, mid-trib. Is it? I get asked. I get asked all the time. Every place I go, yeah. Walid, is it pre-trib? Is it mid-trib? Or is it post-trib? I know what you're asking. You're asking if you're going to go through the problems in yeah. the Bible, the issues, the eschatological yeah. part. You don't want to be part of it. Yeah. You know, you want to leave. You know. So obviously, you're not pre-trib. <laughs> well, I, uh, you know, I don't really take a position. Yeah. I know. I don't like to take a position. It's a divisive issue. Sure, sure. It's very divisive. Right. To right. talk about pre-post-mid. Sure. What we should be talking about is. Are we ready for the rapture? Yeah. The Bible, Jesus says, be ready. Be ready. Yeah. Uh, he comes as a thief. Yeah. So if he says, be ready, we are to be ready. We are to do the Lord's business. Right. And, you know, he, though he tarries, we still keep going. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother, for your call. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right. Why don't we take the next caller right now? Welcome. You're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Uh, hello, good evening. Good evening, and welcome to our program. Uh, this is Riyadh. Uh, I am calling, and God bless you all, uh, Pastor Joseph and Walid and uh, David. So it uh, really is a good show tonight. Welcome. And last night and this weekend, and every weekend uh, we see you on TV. God bless you. Uh, Mr. Walid, I am your neighbor. I am from Or Shalim. Or Shalim? Ah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Jewish or Arab? No, no I am a Christian. <laughs> Christian Arab? Uh, yeah, I say, okay, you want to call me Arab? I, I like to say I am a Christian. Hallelujah. Well, how about Israeli Arab? <laughs> oh, it doesn't bother me. Jesus is Jew. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, anyway, God bless you, uh, all of you, three of you. Yeah. But uh, you mentioned about Muhammad, who's higher, Muhammad or Allah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, believe me, uh, I think Muhammad. Yeah, I think so. Because uh, and, uh, there is hadith... Uh, uh, about Muhammad and Allah, man sabba Allah yustatab. Anyone cuss Allah or yeah. say a bad thing about Allah, Allah will forgive you. You pray for him, he will give you. But if you cuss Muhammad, you must be killed. Yes. That means uh, Muhammad is higher than Allah. That reference. Yes. Oh, because yeah. Muhammad yeah. wanted to be worshipped. Also, yeah. Yeah. Muslim, when they pray, they say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, uh, in the name of Allah, this is Allah's name. Then after that, the two names, ar-Rahman and rahim <laughs> Is this is Allah gave them to Muhammad, to nobody else. Mm. That means Muhammad, he's merciful, and uh, Rahman, and Rahim, and this is big life. He's a mercy to the world, right? Uh-huh. The I got to ask Allah. you, brother, and, and I asked Brother Walid, and we'll challenge the Muslims. Uh, when uh-huh. they say, uh, Ya Salla Allahu, Ya Salla Allah, yeah. Ya Salla Allah Alayhu wa Salim. Salla Allah Alayhu wa Salim. In Arabic, Salah, if you, say, you open the dictionary, is pray. Is a tawassul ila Allah. You're asking forgiveness or for uh, help from God. Tawassul wa tadarra ila Allah. Okay, now, now, but Yasallah, Yasallah Allah 
You pray li- literally, literally, it means Allah, he prays, right? Yes, pray, pray on Muhammad because uh, right. Muhammad is better than Allah, is higher than Allah. Okay, now that's what I want to ask you and then ask any Muslim callers. Allah, he prays on Allahu, on Muhammad. What does it, we know what it means to pray to Muhammad. That would make him God. What does it mean to pray on Muhammad? Because Allah, in this case, Allahu, right? Uh, like if I say, Ana Aruh Allah al Markaz, right? I'm going to go to the to the market, right? Yes. Using the same preposition. In that case, you would be two. Yes. So uh, does it really mean? What does it mean to pray upon Muhammad? Does that mean to pray to Muhammad? What does it mean? It really doesn't matter what it means. Mm. Because even if you take the Muslim argument, yeah. it's upon him. Yeah. He doesn't worship Muhammad. Yeah. But the question is, Allah prays. It's like praying in Muhammad's name, isn't it? If he prays upon him. Yeah, Muslims, tell us what the upon part means. We'd like to know <laughs> what, that. What, what does it mean upon Muhammad rather than anyone else? What yeah. does it mean for Allah to be praying upon Muhammad? Just the fact that your Allah prays is rather curious to us as Christians because our God, God the Father, needs no prayers whatsoever. He's no one to pray to because he alone is God, the receiver of all prayer. All right, brother, thanks so much. Did you have anything else you wanted to share or ask? I have another question. Go ahead. Uh, not the question to tell you some more about Muhammad. Please. At the end of time, uh, Muhammad, he's going to sit on the chair of Allah. Uh, that means Allah is going to stand up. Muhammad is going to take Allah chair. Hmm. Now, can, can you say that one more time? Because I didn't quite understand all of it. Okay. At the end of time, Muhammad yeah. is going to meet Allah. Is going to take Allah chair, which is Arshullah, and he's going to sit on the, uh, the Allah chair. Yeah. And we ask the Muslim, that means Allah is going to stand up, Muhammad is going to sit in his chair. So Muhammad is going to sit on the throne of Allah. Is this in the hadith? No, this, by, by, by the way, this is, this, is, this is an interpretation of a verse in the Quran. This okay. is an interpretation of a verse in the Quran. Surah, Surah, Surah 1779. Uh, let me read it. Let me read it. I've got it right here. Uh, Surah 1779. Uh, yeah. Let me give you Halali Khan. Uh, matter of fact, let me give you just some. Let me give you Pikthal and then Halali Khan yeah, because uh, you can see through Halali Khan how the how the Muslim scholars are interpreting this. So Pikthal says, "And some part of the night awake for it, uh, a largest for thee. It may be that thy Lord will raise thee to a praised estate. Ta- this is a you here as Muhammad. So this is oh. singular. Uh, it may be that thy Lord will raise thee to a praised estate. What does it mm. mean for Muhammad to be raised to a praised estate?" Now let me read it to you in Halali Khan. Yeah. And in some parts of the night also offer prayer uh, with it, with, <coughs> recita- with reciting the Quran, uh, as an additional prayer for you, O Muhammad. It may be that your Lord will raise you to a station of praise and glory, i.e. Ooh. the highest degree in paradise. Uh. And Praise some of the commentators say this means that Muhammad will share uh, Allah's throne, the, the highest Lord. degree in paradise, the station of praise and glory. Yeah, he's also called mm. Yaminullah. Yeah, the right, the right hand. hand of God. Mm. So essentially, so he equal. does sit on the throne on the right hand of God, Amazing. just as Christ sits on the right hand of the Father. Amazing. But remember, Muslims make no distinction between any of the prophets. You right, know that, right, right. You? Brother, thank you so much. Anything else you got to share with us? There is another two things, please. Please go ahead. <laughs> this is good. Uh, also, on the forehead of Allah, yeah. you will see the name of Muhammad. La ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad rasa wa ra. And uh, also, I want to tell you about the black stone. Yeah. The black stone is the right hand of Allah. Every Muslim go to Mecca, must uh, touch and kiss the black stone. Allah will remember the Muslims in, in Al Jannah. And in, inside, one Muslim one time came on the talk show, on the chat room. And he said they, they kept one small piece from the black stone. They find out there is video camera. Allah will remember everyone visit Mecca just for the Saudi to make money. This is the, the, game, the game of Islam. And if you ask the Muslim, they will go left, right, up, side, down, all around. This is Islam. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Thank you, dear brother. You're a, a great blessing. You're a mercy to us. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Amazing. This I, is, I never heard that. It's in God's war on terror. All these things. <laughs> yeah. Is, we documented it, uh, that the black stone in the end will have mouth and it speaks 
and it will have ear, it will hear. Now, where is that in the Bible? In Daniel, it says the well, statue, he'll give a voice to it. Well, so? in the Bible, it talks about the image of the beast the will come alive. Yeah, you yeah. Know? But they took that <coughs> to make it the, the black stone. Right. However, that, yeah. however, the Muslims are not wrong in yeah. thinking that the black stone is an image. Yeah. It because, as, as I mentioned last night, it's an idol. in Acts chapter 19, verse 35, do not worship Artemis that, and her image that fell from heaven. That was a black stone. It was a meteor that but fell from the sky. But this is the same one. This is a, yeah. this, well, that was in Ephesus. In F, but yeah. the concept is the same. It was the same thing. It was a, it was a yeah, stone a that meteor. fell from heaven. It's a black stone. But it wasn't that stone. No, they, it was they, not they, that black they, stone. They, 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 in the ancient world, anytime some rock <laughs> fell from heaven, they would, start, they would treat it as an idol. Right. The difference is Christians would eventually get rid of them, and yeah. Muslims would hang, hang up. Would hang on to one, one in particular, no, because just, Muhammad kissed it. And you remember Umar yeah. saying, I would never kiss you. I would never do this. I would never do this. But Muhammad did it. Yeah. Same yeah. thing as we find today. Muslims, I, I don't know. Sleep no, with, no, sleep with my... Yeah. It's in the, in the hadith. That Amazing. The, had not the Prophet himself kissed you, I would have never kissed you. So, so Muslims, call in and tell us, where is your poor Allah going to go when Muhammad tells him to get out of his chair? Uh, where does Allah go? You know, they always ask us and they make fun of us. They mock our Jesus. What kind of you think Jesus is God? What, does God use the bathroom? Mm -hmm. Or what about your Allah? What's he going to do? Sit on the floor when Muhammad takes his throne? Give us a call. We'd like to hear from you. 248-416-1300. <laughs> I, I can't understand. Brother David, we're getting a lot of material for future shows here. Uh, thanks to Brother Walid. I say, <laughs> and to our wonderful callers. Any other comments before we take the next call? Do you have anything else? No, okay. We got a lot of callers. Let's take the next one right now. Welcome. You're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello. How are you, gentlemen, tonight? Good. Good. I hope you are, dear sir. Yes, I am, Pastor Joseph. This is Mark Harding from Canada. Yes, yes. I'm glad to hear your voice. And yours. I'm glad to see you're still kicking. And Walid, God bless you in your work and ministry, and uh, may Jesus protect you and keep you. Well, by the, by the way, the, the, one second, Brother Mark. Do you know of Brother Mark Harding? This dear brother uh, was persecuted in Canada under their laws. Why? Because he uh, preached and said that Islam is essentially uh, of the devil. Yes. Uh, and so what you're doing here in America, he got put in jail for. Can no. you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, so look out. Don't go to Canada. So he, he is carrying his cross. <laughs> Praise God, he's carrying was, his cross. I was just going to ask if you could come to Canada, Walid. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Joseph. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, the, the worst they can do is deport him, and that's a free ride home, so why not? Well, yeah. yeah, but it's not an it's not issue free ride home. I think we're working on it. We're changing it, and we are going to be going to Canada. Good. So, praise uh, God. Well, praise God. I hope uh, you come into the Ontario area and the Toronto area specifically. That's where I am, and I can help you uh, organize if I can. But uh, I have a couple of questions for you, Walid. I, I was hoping you might be able to help me. Back in that issue, it was back in uh, 1997, I believe, somewhere in there, the kids, the Islamic students, were in the schools praying on Friday. They had been given permission by the Board of Education in Ontario to do that uh, in this one school. And it was on a Friday, and it, it interfered with their regular classes. In other words, uh, the kids would go into the auditorium, and they'd start praying, and uh, the class would go over into their math or English or whatever it would be, and uh, this was okay for the Board of Education. The reasoning was that the kids would have to go to the mosque in the afternoon, lunchtime, miss a couple hours of school to get to the mosque, pray, and come back. So they figured, let's have the prayers at school, and that's how it all started. The problem, of course, being that uh, Christians can't pray, uh, Jews can't pray, uh, Buddhists can't pray. Nobody can pray, but now all of a sudden the Muslims have this uh, permission. Now, it took a lot of doing, but that finally was uh, overturned, and I was allowed, and praise God, uh, that was stopped. My question was that I didn't realize years afterwards, while he didn't, maybe you know, Praying in school for the Muslims, or praying in a mosque, rather, for Muslims, I've been told two things. The first thing is that they can make up their Friday prayers in the morning or in the evening if they miss the afternoon prayer. And the second thing was that one of the books, now I'm not too sure if it's uh, Sharia, uh, or rather uh, Sunni, uh, or, or, uh, or Shia, whether or not uh, one of the books I read, it said that you have to be within a certain uh, area, a <coughs> kilometer, miles, within the mosque, before you can pray, or otherwise, if you're if you're clear, if you're closer to a mosque, 
you, your prayers, you have to go to the mosque. If you're outside of the perimeter, 200 kilometers or whatever it is, then you must uh, say the prayers in, a, in the mosque. You're, you're not allowed to say them uh, uh, within that kilometer base. So I'm just wondering if you know about that. Was that, was that something I maybe could have used in my court case? Well, I'm not sure exactly what's the distance, but you're right. If there is a close mosque, you pray in the mosque. If you can uh, pray in a group, it's Salat al-Jama'ah, or the group prayer, then it's best to have a group praying together, regardless to where you are, if, the, if, you're, if you're not close to a mosque. But you see, the whole concept of uh, praying in schools for the Muslims has nothing to do with uh, problems of the mosque not being near, so on and so forth. <coughs> the idea is to establish a tradition. And once the tradition and the precedence becomes established, then the idea becomes, well, since we did it in this school, it becomes a case in point. Let's yeah. do it in other schools. Sure. You see, then the thing spreads all over. It's like, yeah. you know... And that's uh, exactly, well, that was exactly what, what it was starting to happen. But according to the Board of Education, that school shouldn't have been doing it in the first place, and so it was stopped. Uh, it was a public high school. It was a grade uh, uh, 7 <laughs> to 10 kind of thing. But, I mean, um, from what I was told was that the prayers that they say in the school, if they're within that perimeter of going to a mosque, are, are no good. No matter if you stay at home and you're within the perimeter of the mosque, but yes. you're too lazy to go to the mosque and pray, you pray at home, the prayers are useless. They're not, they're not any good. That's so correct. Is what I heard, Walid. No, it's correct. You have to pray if there's a it mosque that's close by, you go pray in the mosque in Salat al-Jama'ah or the group prayers. So the prayers would be no good then, Walid? <coughs> right. But, but okay, see, the same thing happened, you know, uh, in the meatpacking factories. In Greeley, Colorado, for example, yeah. the uh, Somali uh, employees, they're demanding to have bidets. <laughs> uh, what's the bidets for? So they can wash their private parts <coughs> before they pray. You know, yeah. and why should the meatpacking company supply bidets for Muslims in a meatpacking company? Are you supposed to be working in a meatpacking company and not washing your behinds? <laughs> you know, in a, in a bidet before you pray. Uh, the, the problem in a meatpacking company, you don't, in Islam, they don't, I, don't, I don't recall people use soap even. You know, they do the wudu and all these things. Yeah. So you go wash your private part after all these things, and then you do wudu. And yeah. it's not really cleansing from a mother's yeah. standpoint. There's no sanitary value in this. Yeah. You can even use the dirt if you don't have water. If you don't have water, you can use the dirt. But yeah. the issue is not sanitary. It yeah. does not follow the Islamic washing does not follow... Uh, United States rules and sanitary, sanitary rules for health department. In, 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 in Sunan Abu Dawood, yeah. they asked about the well of, of <laughs> Buddha, <laughs> where where they were throwing dead animals in there and human waste and menstrual cloths. That yeah. was like their their garbage pit, but there yeah. was water in there. Yeah. And they said, Muhammad, can we use this? And he yeah. said, Of course. What? Nothing can make water impure. There you go. Wild Nothing. stuff. I tell you what. <laughs> well, I want. I want. <laughs> well, brother make Mark, me a sandwich after that one. <laughs> uh, oh man, uh, oh. brother Mark, anything else you have for us, or we shall we go on? Well, I just wanted to say thank you. God bless you guys. Uh, when I was in the school on the Friday to see if these kids were praying, they did, they did have to wash themselves first. I went into the washroom. There were kids washing in the toilets because there wasn't enough. Uh, oh, I mean, there was 90 kids, and they had to get to prayers, and they only got so much time. Uh, so the school itself was thinking at the time to put in more showers for the kids. Oh, so it my. shows you what kind of length they'll go to. The demification of the West, a terrible thing. May God save yeah. us all. Brother Mark, I'd love to hear from you uh, off camera sometime. Let's get together. I still owe you a lunch. No, <laughs> well, bring Walid with you, and we'll <laughs> make a day of it. And uh, I'll tell you something. The Lord Jesus prays his name, and hopefully he'll allow us to uh, light a fire in Canada and spread the good news about Jesus Christ and prove that Islam is satanic Amen. and Muhammad is a false prophet. Amen. Amen. Guys, Praise God. You guys. You too. Thank you, Brother Mark. All right. Well, it's good to hear from Brother Mark Harding. What a blessing. All right. Let's see if we have another caller. Welcome. You're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello. You're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Yes. Good evening. <laughs> good evening. God bless you all. God bless you. Uh, really, I have a question. Uh, I asked for uh, a lot of Muslims, yeah. but nobody uh, answered me. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, mm -hmm. number three. Number three, Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, how... That's the start of the revelation. Okay. With yes. Khadija and Muhammad becoming so this so will be volume one, number yeah, three. Number okay, three. volume one, number three. All right. 
Yes. Uh, there are a lot, of, quite a few questions on it, but uh, my question is, who is the prophet? Is uh, Khadija or Muhammad? Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, it says, first of all, uh, here, uh, when Jibril came to Muhammad, uh, he hit him so hard. <coughs> Why he would have hurt, uh, hit him so hard? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why Jibreel, he didn't come to him and say, I am Jibreel, I came from the God, and, and uh, you are a prophet of Islam. That's he a good dra dramatization, that. by the way. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> he did not say that. He said... Yeah. Well, did, did, uh, didn't he, he strangle him? He strangled him almost to death. Yeah, I mean, it's a strangling. When do we ever see that in, in the Bible, uh, a prophet, uh, you know, comes or an angel and strangles somebody? Exactly. Times, in every single uh, existence in the Bible where angels show themselves up, yeah. say, be at peace. Yeah, yeah, and, and lift them up. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah. Or don't bow to me, you know. Yeah. Right, don't bow, and, and they're not strangling them, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, yeah. go ahead. And, and he, he, he ran away, he came to Khadija, and he was, he was afraid, he was scared so much. Yeah. How come a prophet and he was scared so much from the uh, angel? Yes, he says, Deathrini, Deathrini, uh, cover me with a blanket because he was shivering from fear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. yes, indeed. That's what. I uh, told him, uh, calm down, calm down. You are the, the a prophet. How she knew, he did not know how she knew he was a prophet. And, and uh, she is the uh, minus, minus uh, brain. And uh, all women in Islam, right? It's minus brain and uh, faith. Yeah, he submitted to her judgment. Let me let me stop just for a moment, brother David. Do you ever bring this up in apologetic and debate? What do Muslims say about this idea that Muhammad clearly thought he was demon possessed? Do they reject the hadith? What do they say? Uh, the 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 only thing, and and I, I think this is, if it weren't for all the other spiritual problems he had, if this yeah. were the only issue. Yeah. Uh, Muslims say that just in that culture, yeah. if you were a poet, they believe that a spirit was attached to a poet. Uh -huh. And so even though nothing's too, nothing's, uh, too bad about Muhammad receiving revelation, since he was ignorant, oh. uh, he would have thought, ah, if I'm receiving revelations, that makes me one of these poets, and that means that I'm somehow possessed. Okay. The problem is with it pressing upon him and him thinking he's dead and yeah. commanding him to, to read and he doesn't know how to right. read and stuff, right. just not, uh, not, not. Well, not what we're familiar with and from the biblical tradition. And suicidal after the first suicidal makes him was depressed. Complete. Makes him depressed. Yeah. Suicidal. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very and, good. And 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 the, the the point that the point that uh, he made in the beginning uh, yeah. about Khadija. Khadija. Yeah. You must believe Khadija is a prophet because yeah. she's the one who who knew. And this is a woman who, even <coughs> afterwards, when she would get pregnant, would pray to Allah, Aluz and Manat. Uh, she's absolutely. praying to fall. She's praying to false <laughs> goddesses. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, as intercessors, and yet Muslims treat her as an infallible guide to prophethood. Who's, so she, who's she's a prophet? The John the Baptist, yeah. who claimed him as the Messiah. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. But one one thing is clear. One thing is clear. When Muhammad ran out of that cave, yeah, uh, depressed and suicidal, yeah, he was convinced that he had encountered uh, some sort of evil spirit. He did right. not walk out of there. Oh, I've seen an angel, and, right. and I'm a prophet. Right. Uh, so he's the only one. He's the only prophet in history whose first encounter with his revelations he thought was uh, demonic in origin. Amazing. And, of course, the only prophet well, in he, history... When, when he used to get the inspiration, yeah. uh, Islam documents it. They said, uh, in the Hadith, it documents it, that the noise that came out of his neck, his neck thickened up, and the noise came like khawar al-jamal, like yeah. the noise of a camel. It was a very, very, very scary noise. Yeah. And it was a different voice than his... In Amazing. other words, there was other voices coming out of him. It's like as his, movie. You can see yeah. the whites of his eyes yeah. flipping. You can see him shivering and also foamed from yeah. his mouth. Yeah. As, as, the, uh, as the wahi, they call it the wahi now, yeah. is inspiring him. Yeah. This wahi inspired him, well, the angel yeah. was inspiring him. Yeah. Of course, this is not something godly at all. He'd be, he'd be laid out on the ground, <laughs> his face would turn red. Uh, the, you know, very different from the prophets. But, this is the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord. But it's so amazing. We see this exact picture in the Bible, but not of prophets, my Muslim friends. This exact picture painted of your prophet Muhammad, supposedly, when he has the wahi come upon him, is the exact, exact picture we have of demon-possessed individuals who were freed by Jesus Christ our Lord.
That's right. So Muhammad is the only prophet to think that he was demon possessed, the only prophet to become suicidal, the only prophet to be a victim of black magic, uh, giving him delusional thoughts and false beliefs, and the only prophet to deliver a revelation to his followers and to come back and say, sorry, Satan tricked me into delivering that one, friends. Amazing. Uh, Unique in many ways, we agree. He is a unique. He is a unique prophet. Absolutely. So indeed, the Muhammad is a prophet, but not of Yahweh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, that's right. Oh, he's a prophet, that's all right. right. So we agree with the Muslims. Muhammad yes. is a prophet. He, yeah, yeah. But not of Yahweh. And, and, yeah. and we we yeah. agree with Muslims when they say the Bible predicts that Muhammad's a prophet. When, Absolutely. When Jesus says, uh, "Beware of false prophets. They come yeah, to you Muhammad in sheep's is, clothing, yeah. but inwardly they are ravening wolves." You Jews, you Christians, I love you guys. Uh, Until yeah. I am in power, he, he then the himself, swords come out. Behold, what they tell you, he comes from the desert. Yeah. Don't believe it. Even it Jesus is. predicted there that someone is. will come from the desert claiming messianism. Don't believe it. Amazing. Who came from the desert? Yeah, amazing. Uh, dear brother, are you still with us? Any? Uh, are you still with us there? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, any last question or comment before we move on? Okay. Uh, before, before we uh, finish, uh, why Khadija took him to the uh, to Waraqab al -Nufa? Yeah. If he knew he was a, a prophet, why uh, she going to take him to uh, Waraka bin Nufal? And Waraka bin Nufal, he will uh, uh, explain to him he is a prophet. Yeah. All this, all this hadith, uh, it means that there are, uh, Muhammad, he's not prophet at all. He did not know he's a prophet. Yeah. How going to be a prophet? And he doesn't know uh, nothing about, uh, uh, like, I mean, uh, he is a prophet or not. How yeah. uh, other people will know he's a prophet and he did not know. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Well, thanks so much for your call and pointing out these important hadith. If you stick around for the second show, starting in about 45 minutes or a little more than that, uh, hopefully we'll talk more specifically about these particular topics. Thank you, dear brother, and God bless you. All right. Well, I think we'll take a few more calls before our last break. Let's take uh, another call right now. Welcome. You're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello, everybody. This is Manu. Hello. Welcome. Manu! Welcome, Manu. Hi. Welcome. As I reach uh, for a glass of water. For, Pardon me. <laughs> for Pastor Joseph, you really should uh, uh, practice that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, you tell uh, us. Tell us now, Manu. What, what does it okay, mean? That's, I think that's the challenge you presented. So Yeah. Uh, there, there are two verbs in Arabic or words in Arabic. One is hamd, one is sal. Um, I'm going to the English tra uh, uh, dictionary here just to get a, a reference point. Okay, for okay, Manu, before you go to the dictionary, tell us exactly, you're a Muslim, what is it that Muslims say? They say, Yasalla, go ahead and finish it. Yasalla Allah. Okay, thank you very much. So now you're going to give us the uh, understanding of what that means. Because, by the way, Manu, by the way, Manu, uh, your uh, Islamic literature, your Qurans, everything that, that we see in the West, it says that it simply means peace be upon him and blessings. Is that what you're going to tell us? No, it's, it's more than that. Okay, good. Thank you. Go ahead. Because there's a reference. There's a reference in the Quran that <coughs> angels are praying for the believers and the the uh, the. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabiyya ya ilidin amanu sallu alaihi wa sallimu taslima, and which which is the verse you're talking about. Uh, all you believers, the uh, Inna Allah wa malaikatuh Allah and His angels <coughs> pray upon the Prophet, sallu alaihi wa sallimu pray upon him and give salutations. That is correct. I believe so. I, I mean, right now I don't have that verse in my in front of me. Okay, well, Manu. Then what what does it mean? The 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 verb hum or or worship is different than this verb or this word. This word is more uh, an expression of warm approval or admiration. Wh which so, word are you referring Hamid, to? Hamd. Sal. 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 Yasalla is pray. He prays. The third person masculine well, singular. Can you give us examples of how that's not used to pray? Give me examples. Besides the hadith, give me an example in the Arabic language or the Arabic usage of this term salla to mean not to pray. The, the, 
I, I, the only thing I can tell you is that the, the verb used for, for worship is hamd. That's why Muslims say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Okay, so when somebody the, says... The, the verb hamd is different than this. Okay, the five pillars and of Islam... More meaning. Five pillars of Islam. The first pillar is as shahadatan The second pillar is what? As-salah, right? Salah, That's prayer correct. five times a day. So are you saying the second pillar of Islam... Salah doesn't mean prayer? Um, this is different than Salah. Is <laughs> it's the prayer. same verb. So you're saying the use for the word, the same word Salah and Salah could mean absolutely different things. Is that what you're saying? So, uh, Ma I'm Manu, saying let, let me simplify for you. We, we understand you, you went to Ahmed or, or Alhamdulillah, this praise. But we're asking... What exactly does salla, yasalla, yasalla, what does that mean? What do you think that word means specifically? That, that's what I was saying. <clears throat> Since there is a difference between hamd, the verb hamd in Arabic, and this, this uh, word is, is, more of a, is more of an indication of expression of a warm approval or admiration of God. So, you mean that the, so you're saying that yasalla does not mean he prays. Is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying. It's more of an expression of admiration or approval on the Prophet. Well, give us an example anywhere in the Arab literature or the Islamic literature that you can tell from the context it doesn't mean pray. <coughs> Do you have any example? Or, or, gi or give us an Arabic, no, uh, an Islamic dictionary like this one here, an Islamic dictionary that, or uh, an Arabic dictionary that tells us this word means what you just said. I'm waiting. I'm just saying, no, I don't have one. I, what I'm saying is that the, the, the verb hamd is actual what is used for worshiping God. So it's different than this verb and this word. So therefore, this has a slightly different uh, the underlying definition. Okay, but Manu, we, we didn't say we didn't say that yasalla means worship. We said yasalla means pray. And by the way, you're right. The word ham, hamda, the, the triliteral root, ha, mim, de, this word has the idea of worship or praise, and that's why we get your name, Muhammad, for your prophet, which means literally the praised one. If we take your definition of that root word, it would be the worshipped one. The, the, the name given to him, the name given to him was by his... Uh, before that, I mean, when there were pagans, and that was a perfectly <coughs> Arabic name for that time. That, that has nothing to do with Muhammad never gave himself that name. If Muhammad came and his name was, for example, Ali. Okay, ho, ho, give, give us another uh, individual in the time of Muhammad uh, who was uh, his contemporary, whose name was Muhammad before Islam. Go ahead and give us an example, because you just made a claim that that was a typical name for Arabs. So give us uh, the name... The there, full name there, of another guy named Muhammad at the same time. And we'll go study the history. Given to him, the name given to him was not given by himself. There is no rec recorded history of him changing his name after he's claiming to be the prophet of Islam. Okay, that's fine. Let, let's say that he didn't change his name. You just made a truth claim, Manu. We want to understand your evidence. You just said that Muhammad was a typical name of Arabs uh, at that time. Give us an example of someone else who was named Muhammad at his, at his time. I never said it was a typical name. I never said it was. I said it was a name given to him in the pagan times by his relatives or his actual parents, which he didn't have. He was an orphan. So I, I believe it was either his grandfather or, or actual his mother. I think it was uh, his uncle. Uh, his I think the Sira says well, his uncle, his but anyway. His grandfather passed away. After his grandfather passed away, also he was living with his uncle. Right, so he went I, right. Through his right. mother, his mother, his grandfather, and <laughs> then his, to his uncle. My um, second point, I don't want to dwell too much on this and take your time. My second point was the fact that David uh, Wood was saying this afternoon that for 10 years he preached peacefully, uh, more or less. One of the main issues that they didn't want to <coughs> kill him was the fact that he was from Quraysh. And the Quraysh, he was, the, because of his status and because of his relatives and family, they had other uh, 
social conditions in that society that they wouldn't just automatically kill somebody because of their status. And the fact that in the Quran also uh, points out to this fact that he fled Mecca because they wanted to, at the end to kill him, and he was hiding in the cave with Abu Bakr. Uh, and that's there's a verse in the Quran about it. Well, my, my, my new, my new, we're, we're, we're going to call, call back on the second show because we're going to specifically address this issue. I'll give you the short response. I brought that up to point out Muslims are constantly <coughs> claiming that the mean pagans in Mecca were horribly intolerant and they persecuted the Muslims. My point was that Muhammad and the Muslims survived preaching openly condemning people's beliefs outside the Kaaba for 10 years in Mecca, and they made it. They made it out with their lives. You could argue, based on the Muslim sources, the historical Muslim sources, that around two people during this time were killed under the persecution. My point was that if I went to Mecca today and preached against the religious beliefs of the people there, I would not last 10 minutes. You say, ah, but Muhammad had... A protector. Well, there was a community of Muslims. They weren't all under the Quraysh. They aren't, weren't all under a part of the Quraysh tribe. Uh, and again, they they survived. They made it out of there. Uh, and I'll tell you, if I went to if I went to Mecca today, it wouldn't matter if I'm a member of the Quraysh or who my buddy was. If I stand outside the Kaaba and I say your beliefs are false, your God is false, your prophet is false, the Quran's a lie. I'm dead right there. Uh, the only point of all this, I'm not saying that uh, the persecution was okay. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it be consistent here. I'm, it, was a, it was a call to Muslims, which you wouldn't even fall into this category because I doubt you agree with the, 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 the Muslims in Mecca. My point was a call to consistency for Muslims. If you're going to condemn the pagans of Mecca for how intolerant they were, all the more you should condemn Muhammad and all the, all the, the Orthodox Muslims who came after him because they've been far more intolerant than the pagans were. That was the only point, Manu. But again, we're going to talk about this more on the second show. We can talk about it all you want. I wanted to go back to your point about Salah being not, mm -hmm. not something that could be used besides prayer. Mm -hmm. Now, I quote Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir, the classical Quran commentator, <coughs> corroborates what we're saying about the word Salah. In the Arabic language, this is Ibn Kathir, the basic meaning of Salah is supplication. In religious terminology, Salah is used to refer to the acts of bowing and prostration. That's Ibn Kathir himself. Now, uh, you also refer to the Quranic verse, uh, Allah and his angels, in Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhaladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allah and his angels pray upon the Prophet, O ye who believe, pray upon him and salute him with a worthy salutation. This verse is clearly interpreted in the Quran itself. You know, uh, how about Quranic hermeneutics? Yeah. The Quran yeah. should be interpreted best with the Quran. Yes. Uh, in the Quran, it says, He, Allah, ver, uh, Surah 45, mm -hmm. verse 12. He, <coughs> Allah, has subjected to you, Muhammad. Allah subjected to Muhammad whatever is in the heavens mm. and whatever is in the earth. Mm. Now, this kind of ownership of the heavens on the, in the earth can belong to no one but God. Mm. So here, Allah himself is giving Muhammad the authority to subject everything in heaven as well mm. as on earth mm. to him. Mm. Where is Allah? Mm. Where is he left out of the scene? Yeah. So very clear, if you look at the context of Muhammad and Allah giving him Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud, the glorious name, a name after our own name, Allah <coughs> said that, you know, after our own name, after Allah's mm. name himself. Mm. Now remember, in the East, in the Middle East, giving a name or a title is something yeah. big. It's yeah. not like just giving a name, <coughs> Muhammad, to your uh, baby boy. Right. No, yeah. to give a name to someone is to give basically a I mean, title yeah. and uh, just like the names of Allah these titles are you saying Ar-Rahman doesn't mean anything of course it means something Ar-Rahim means something to give him Al-Maqam al Mahmud, Al-Maqam al Mahmud, or Muhammad the praised yeah. one the glorious one exactly the same titles in fact Allah himself said and stated that we give Muhammad a name after our own name mm. in other words a godly name mm. 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 these tributes only to Jesus 
Amazing. Okay. All right, Manu, thank you so much for your call. Stick around, and in our second show in about 45 minutes or so, we're going to be speaking more specifically about your question and the topic that you're dealing with. Thanks so much for your call. We're going to take our last break right now before we go to our last segment, our last callers. So stick around, and we'll be right back after this break. Praise the Lord. We were just looking at the verse that uh, Brother Walid here on Jesus or Muhammad was giving us uh, from the Quran, Surah 45, verse 12 and 13, which says, how does it read, Brother Walid? Allah has subjected. Uh, it reads in 45, 12, <coughs> He, Allah, has subjected to you, Muhammad, whatever is in heavens and whatever is in the earth. And whatever is in the sea. Yes. Yeah. Everything. Everything. The whole kingdom. And he doesn't exclude uh, himself, I guess. Allah has given to you everything in the heavens. And I guess that includes Allah. You see it in the Arabic. It doesn't ex yeah, take a look in the Arabic. All right. Well, we just have about uh, 25 minutes left in our program tonight. And we've been talking about uh, Brother Walid Shabbat's book, God's War on Terror. Islam, Prophecy, and uh, the Bible. Isn't that the right title? That's yes. the title. Islam, Prophecy, and the Bible. Our title underneath there is Unlocking Bible Mysteries. We've been talking about Islam and how Islam and the system of Islam seems to be the Antichrist system. And uh, Brother Walid says, in, in fact, it is the Antichrist system pictured in the Bible, uh, and that the Antichrist himself will be a Muslim. And uh, that Islam, Muhammad, and the Mahdi, this coming one, and the end times of Islamic uh, theology, eschatology, it, both are indwelt by the same spirit, and that spirit would be the spirit of? The Antichrist. The Antichrist and Satan himself. That's correct. All right. These are the claims by Brother Walid. I think he's pretty much uh, convinced many of us that they are so, but we'd like to hear from you, whether you're Muslim, Christian, or otherwise, call in 248-416-1300. We'd like to hear from you. And remember also, once again, you can buy Brother Walid's book uh, on the Internet. He said Amazon, but also at his website, which will come up. There it is right now, www.shubat.com. Calm. You can buy his book there. And also, I'd like to remind you one last thing before we get to the callers, that uh, ABN is still uh, trying to raise funds. Why? Because we've got special projects? Well, yes, we do. But actually, we don't have commercials. We don't go to the world for uh, the financing of this ministry. We go to you, the body of Christ, those Christians out there who are listening, so that we might uh, be able to share with one another, communicate one an with one another in this great gospel endeavor, so we might be able to continue to produce quality programs like this with Brother Walid Shubat and many others. Uh, Kamal Salim is also on the way uh, coming here not too long from now. More programs, more, uh, more
more opportunities for you to be blessed by biblical teaching, preaching, and apologetics. So we do pray that you would pray how God would lay upon your heart to give to this ministry and also simply to commit to pray for us because it is a spiritual war as you see over every night live taking place Allahua, and that's a literal and figurative uh, term there because it is a spiritual war fought out in the air that's by right. the prince of the power of the air, which gets us back to our topic. All right, let's take our next caller right now. Welcome, you're on the air with Jesus or Muhammad. Hello? <laughs> oh, hello! Hey, it's Brother Frank. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Doing great, man. You got a sermon for us? Uh, no, I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to kind of, you know, just talk to you guys. Just you, thank you for for the program. Okay, thank you. We we thank you for calling in. Um, <coughs> I just want to say that uh, I want to ask you if you got my if you have my email or not. We got your got information, it. and and we want to contact you. And uh, but you know we didn't get home till 3 a.m. last night and didn't get much yeah, sleep. <laughs> so, but we'll catch up with you this week. We want to contact you and and uh, sh fellowship with you, and maybe one day with God's help meet you. May maybe you uh, can be the next uh, Sam Shimon, or even greater than David Wood, if that's possible, uh, or Walid yeah, okay. Shubat. <laughs> so we will give you we will give you a uh, a ring or send an email your way. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thank Hi, buddy. You and uh, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go to answering-islam.org. Answering-islam.org. And uh, pick out a good article on a topic you're interested in. And start studying because I can see that the Lord is going to use you mightily, my young friend. Um, what is it called? Answering? Answering-islam.org. Answering okay. And a uh, ton of good articles there. Pick the topics you're interested in. And uh, I, 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 will, I will personally take you out to talk to some Muslims with me uh, once you've been thoroughly trained. Okay. All right, brother. All right. There, there, there we go. Thank you, Brother Frank. We're going to give you a call or email you soon, okay? So thank you so much, and you keep the faith and uh, keep seeking the Lord, all right? Okay. Do you guys have another show after this? Yes. Okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs> God bless you. Thanks so much, Frank. Well, I guess that'll be our last call for the night. Uh, we sorry for you callers who weren't able to call in, but I just uh, informed that we're going to have to cut the show a little bit short this evening. Uh, but we will be back in about 15, uh, 20 minutes for our next program. But before we get off the air, Brother Walid, I'm sorry we, we didn't mean to uh, cut things too short quickly, but, you know, we really appreciate you being on the last couple nights. No problem. And uh, I want to give you a few minutes just to share whatever you'd like to share uh, a parting shot, if you will, main theme of your message, and uh, whatever you'd like to share with our viewers now. Well, the God of the Bible uh, is the God of uh, prophetic uh, predictions. Yeah. As I mentioned yesterday, for I am God and there is no other. How God describes himself in the Bible is quite differently than Allah describes himself in the Quran. Mm. The God of the Bible says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me foretelling the end from the beginning. Mm. So when you see these things, you know that I am God. So when you, need the, you see the fulfillments of his prediction in the past, that you know that he is God. Uh, he comes and he will be glorious and he will fight the enemies mm -hmm. uh, that comes against the, the Christian world as well as the Jewish. And he will be victorious and he will make, he's the one to make peace. Not as the Mahdi, mm. as the Muslims claim that the Mahdi will bring seven years of peace. No, he will bring what will happen, what the Bible tells us what will happen during those seven years the Muslim claim the Mahdi will bring. Yes, this Mahdi will show up and he will claim to bring seven years of peace. But the Bible tells us after three and a half years, he will break his covenant. And in fact, Islam does allow the breaking of covenant. He will establish a hudna with mm. Israel. He will break that hudna, that covenant, after three years and a half. And he will sit in the temple in Jerusalem, declaring himself to be as he is God, mm. as Brother Joseph eloquently mm. described mm. from uh, Second Thessalonians. Mm. Uh, and that's when all hell will break loose. Mm. And then finally, in the end, you know, Christ will come and he will fight in battle in several areas. In Isaiah 19, he fights Egypt. In Isaiah 10, verse 34, 
he fights against Lebanon. Lebanon shall fall by the mighty one. The mighty one is God. Mm. Christ, in this case, will fight Hezbollah mm. in Lebanon. And Habakkuk chapter 3, he fights against Midian, which is in Arabia. In Isaiah chapter 63, again, he comes out of Edom, which is Arabia, with his garment sprinkled with blood, you know. And they ask him, what is this? This is the blood of the enemies that I came to trample, that it can come against me. In other words, the Muslim world would declare war on the true Messiah, not knowing he is the true Messiah. And he will be victorious against those enemies. So we're telling the Muslims this. So when they see these things happen, that they understand they've been told and forewarned about it. <coughs> it's not because we hate Muslims. It's because we love Muslims. If you love someone, you have to tell them uh, and warn them about what they're doing wrong. In other words, if your brother is going to fall into a ditch, sometimes you have to pull him out of the ditch, even yeah. if you have to break his leg. Yeah. So it is a, a message of love to the Muslims, not a message of hatred. Of course, we don't like uh, Islam, we don't like the Quran. We, we're, we're, we're not uh, hiding that fact. Sure. You know? uh, but there's a difference between not liking Islam and loving the Muslim. Right. So it is our love to the Muslim people. Look, my family is still Muslim. I don't hate my family. I love my family. I wish my family to go to heaven. If somebody loves you, they want you to go to heaven with them. So the Bible is a treasure. I urge you, just from the few examples we gave the last couple of days, <coughs> to look into this treasure. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of a treasure trove. You spend your life looking at it. It will give you great comfort. It will give you uh, the truth. And as uh, Christ said, you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Walid. Well, I uh, just want to say that uh, the answer there is to come to Christ Jesus. So when he comes to you, you will be on the right side. Isn't that right? That's correct. Amen. Why don't we close with prayer? And then in about 20 minutes, we'll come back with a special program with David Wood and myself, special edition of Jesus or Muhammad. Uh, have you got a topic for us yet, Brother David? Uh, we'll come up with something. All right. The Muslims will help us. We'll definitely be it. talking about the spread of Islam. <coughs> okay. Very good. Why, why don't we close in prayer, gentlemen? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you once again for Brother Walid, for Brother David. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to exalt your son Jesus as we look at him throughout the Bible, throughout the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It has one author, you, your Holy Spirit, and it has one theme, and that is, of course, your son Jesus Christ coming to redeem us from our sins, not just uh, Christians, but all who would believe on him, who will become Christians by default because they will believe on the sacrifice that your son Jesus Christ became on that cross 2,000 years ago. Oh, Lord God, impress on the hearts of Muslim people that as they they believe this system of belief called Islam, they're falling right into Satan's trap. The Satan is their greatest enemy, and not Christians, not Jews, and Satan has deceived them. Oh Lord, appear to them in dreams and visions. Change their hearts, make their hearts soft. We pray for Manu, Lord, that he would come to know you as Savior. We pray for our Muslim callers, our Muslim viewers. We pray, Lord God, that you would have mercy upon them, and that they would accept you now in the time of grace, your son Jesus, who came riding on a donkey, came peacefully into Jerusalem. For we know, according to your word, that one day he will ride again, but he will not ride on a donkey, but he will ride on a white horse of war, and his vesture will be dipped in blood, and out of his mouth will go a sword that will smite all of the nations. Help them, Lord God, to come now to that Messiah, Jesus Christ, your son, for salvation. For without him, there is no salvation, for he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to you except through your son, Jesus. And that's our prayer now for Muslims, for whoever is listening, that they would know without a doubt that when these times come, they will have eternal security, knowing that whether they live or they die, they will be with you forever and ever, 100% assurance that comes only through a relationship with you, through your precious Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray right now. Amen and amen. God bless you, and we'll be back in about 20 minutes with another edition of Jesus or Muhammad with David Wood and myself. We'll see you then.